Well, hello, thank you for tuning in to another Bible study. The Apostle Paul tells us that in the last days, perilous times will come. They're here. They're here. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew chapter 24 that nation would rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and also that there would be pestilences. And of course, if COVID-19 isn't a pestilence, then I don't know what is a pestilence. And of course, we see today that Russia is invading Ukraine, of course, and has been now for a number of days. And so many people have been asking the question, would Russia eventually come against Israel, whether in this war or some stage in the future? And so that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at the Word of God. We're going to look at Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. And so I've got a, a reading from Ezekiel chapter 38. We're going to read a few verses, starting at verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rish, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say thus, says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rish, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Of course, the Lord is showing here the shield, the helmet, the sword. But that's because that's what Ezekiel is used to in his day. He's not showing machine guns or battle tanks or anything like that there. He's showing exactly what Ezekiel is used to in his day, the swords and the shields, even though this is a prophetic portion of Scripture. Verse 5. Persia, Ethiopia and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops. The house of Tagarma from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you. And be a guard to, for them. After many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations and they all of them dwell safely. You will ascend coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Verse 10. Thus says the Lord God, On that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind. You will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go up, I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty. To stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired, acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. And then if you drop down to verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to God, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel shall dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land that will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. And then if you drop down to verse 18. And, I will, and it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout my, all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Verse 23. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And we trust that the Lord had a blessing to the reading of his precious word. The prophet Ezekiel 
tells us that an ancient nation known as Magog, who Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, clearly identifies as being the Scythians, the ancient Russians, will come against the nation of Israel in the latter years. <coughs> and Ezekiel 38 verses 1 to 3, here's what we read. Now the word of the Lord came to me, came to Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. In the King James Version, and I'm using the New King James today, but in the King James Version, it says, The chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And the reason why the King James says that is because Rosh can mean chief in the Hebrew. But many would say that the name Rosh here in Ezekiel 38 should actually be translated not as a title, but as a people. And so in the New King James, the New King James has it, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. Gog is the leader and Magog is his land which is composed of three parts, if you notice in the reading, which is Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. He's Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, Ezekiel 38 and verse 2. Rosh, many would say, is Russia, and Meshach, many would say, is Moscow, and also many would say that Tubal is Tobolsk. Jesenius, who was a great Hebrew scholar in the early 19th century, he says that Gog is undoubtedly the Russians. He declared that Rosh was a designation for the tribes which were then north of the Taurus Mountains, dwelling in the neighbourhood of the Volga. And he held that in this name and tribe, we have the first trace in history of the Rosh or the Russian nation. Jesenius, Jesenius also identified Meshach as Moscow, the capital of Russia, and also Tubal, he identified as Tobolsk, which is the earliest province of Asiatic Russia. Now what you have to remember is that these were meandering tribes. They were meandering tribes, and so there's Syrian inscriptions to say that they started off in Asia Minor, or in other words, what we would call today Turkey. And so Meshach and Tabul were originally in Cappadocia and Pontus, which were in what we would call today modern day Turkey. But then they, they were, were migrating tribes, and so they migrated from Asia right up to uh, Russia. Here's what Gabeline says. The land of Magog was located in what is called today the Caucasus and the adjoining, the adjoining steepies. And these three parts of the land, Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, were called by the ancients Scythians. They roamed as nomads in the country around and north of the Black Sea, sorry, north of the Black and the Caspian Seas, and were known as the wildest barbarians. Buman says, it's interesting to note that the very word Caucasus, Caucasus, in the Oriental tongue, he says, means Gog's Fort. And of course, the Caucasus, Caucasus Mountains run through southern Russia. So Gog is the leader of Magog. And that land of Magog is composed up of three parts, which is Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. And therefore, many expositors would agree that Rosh is Russia. Now... You will notice that this invasion happens in the latter years and in the latter days. The latter years and in the latter days. At a time whenever God's people, Israel, have been brought back into the land, back into the mountains of Israel from the nations. And there, it's at a time whenever Israel is dwelling safely that this attack occurs. In Ezekiel 38 verses 8 and 16, here's what we read. After many days you will be visited. Notice, in the latter years. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword 
and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and they all of them dwell safely. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. Now notice, it will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land. In the latter years and in the latter days, the Lord will bring the this people against Israel as in a, a judgment. It will, he will judge Israel, but he will also judge the nations as well during that time. So the invasion is called by many as the war of the latter years and the latter days. The term latter years means in Hebrew, it means the last or the end. It's the last or the end just prior to the second coming of Christ to this earth. I believe it will occur during the, the great tribulation period. And if you notice the chronology in Ezekiel, Israel are restored to the mountains of, of Israel in chapters 36 and 37. And then this invasion happens in chapters 38 and 39. And then you have a new temple in chapters 40 to 48 during the millennial reign of Christ on earth. And Ezekiel 39 verses 21 and 29 we read, Here's what the Lord says, I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment, which I have executed, and my hand, which I have laid on them. And I will not hide my face from them any more, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. And so this corresponds then with what we read in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10, at the time of our Lord's return to earth, to Jerusalem. The Lord says, and I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And so I would like us to look at two points then today. First of all, I would like us to look at the invaders and the invasion. And then secondly, I would like us to look at the deliverer and the deliverance. And so I say this to you by way of an introduction to our subject today. Let's get into this then. First of all, then the invaders and the invasion. The Bible tells us that there will be other nations in federation with Russia, with Russia whenever she makes her move against Israel. So who are they? Well, in Ezekiel 38, verses 5 and 6, we read, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomor and all its troops, the house of Togarma, from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. Of course, in 1935, Persia became what's known today as Iran. But we also see that Kush, or Ethiopia, is with them. Now, some identify Kush here, or Ethiopia as being the African nations. But there's others who would say that the Kush here, or the Ethiopia in Ezekiel's prophecy, was not the Ethiopia of Africa, but a country that was somewhere very near Persia, or what we would know today near modern-day Iran. We also see that Put, or Libya, are with them. Libya here is usually identified with the Libya of Africa, although some also have said that she also may come from somewhere uh, near to Persia, near to Iran. In Genesis 10, we can see the different names of these nations. You see, they were the sons of Japheth. If you remember, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so Genesis chapter 10 is known by scholars as the table of nations. So we can see that the different uh, descendants of Noah and from Japheth, who would develop into these uh, nations. For example, Gomer. Here's what Gabeline says concerning Gomer. He says, valuable information is given in the Jewish Talmud, one of the Jewish writings. He says, Gomer is stated, Gomer is stated there to be the Germani, or in other words, the Germans. He says that the descendants of Gomer moved northward and established themselves in parts of Germany. He says, this seems to be an established fact. But if you remember, these are migrating tribes. And so even Gomer himself, that tribe started off in what we would know today as being Turkey. 
and according to uh, Gabelin, he would say Gabelin, he would say that parts of Gomer migrated to uh, some of Gomer migrated to parts of Germany. We also see uh, the fifth ally is Tagarma, and Tagarma is Turkey and Armenia. Tagarma is usually identified as Turkey or Armenia, although it is extended also by some to include Central Asia. Here's what Remis writes. Geographically, Tagarma has always been the land which we now call Armenia. It is so named in the records of Assyria. Indeed, all Armenian literature, he says, refers to the land and its people as the House of Tagarma. Buman adds, Tagarma, probably the Turkoman tribes of Central Asia, together with Siberia, the Turks, and the Armenians. Now, I want you to notice that this invasion happens at a time when Israel are back in their own land and they're living in a time of peace. In Ezekiel 38, verses 11, verses 14 and 15, here's what we read. You will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. On that day when my people Israel dwell safely, then you will come from your place out of the far north. Notice that Israel are, are dwelling peacefully in the land whenever this invasion happens. But ever from Israel gained their independence on the 14th of May 1948, whenever she became a nation again, it, Israel hasn't known peace. In fact, that, that period is known as the War of Independence. And all Israel is known is really blood and terrorism from that. But during the tribulation period, Israel will experience a time of peace. A time of peace which will be three and a half years. It will be short-lived, of course, because the latter three and a half years is a time of war. But she will experience peace for the first half of the tribulation period. Um, you can read about this in Daniel 9, verses 24 and 20 to 27. Also Isaiah 28 and verse 15, Matthew 24, verse 21, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Whenever the Roman prince, the man of sin, makes a peace treaty with the many of Israel. But that peace treaty will be short-lived. After three and a half years, um, it will be broken. Now, the northern invasion of Israel, I believe, is part of the wider campaign of Armageddon, which lasts three and a half years, in which all the nations will eventually come against Jerusalem. You can read about that in Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45, Zechariah 14, verse 2, and Revelation 16, verse 16. God is against this leader. He is against this leader. In Ezekiel 39, verses 1 and 2 and verse 4, here's what we read. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north, and bring you against the mountains of Israel. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops, and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. In other words, a great feast for the birds and the beasts with the slain who come against Israel. And of course, you can see that in, in Revelation chapter 19 where the, the birds are gathered at Armageddon for the feast whenever the Lord returns. You see, what you've got to remember is Russia wasn't the powerful nation that she is today whenever these prophecies were given. They were tribes, tribesmen. They were migrating tribesmen. But certainly Russia wasn't the powerful nation that she is today. Secondly then, let's look at the deliverer and the deliverance. You see, Israel are God's chosen people and he will not let them be destroyed. Hitler, of course, tried to destroy them, didn't he? He killed about six million Jews. But he didn't wipe out the Jews. God preserved his people. And of course Hitler, many would say, ended up committing suicide in one of his bunkers. 
Israel are God's chosen people. Yes, at the present time they're in a state of unbelief, although many have turned to Jesus and recognised Jesus as the Messiah. But on that great day when the Lord's feet hit the Mount of Olives, at his return, at his second coming, it's then that the Lord will pour out his spirit on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And so all Israel, those who are left at that time, will be saved. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, here's what we read. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be, to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. You see, God has not forgotten his covenant people, Israel. And so we're told in Zechariah 2, verse 8, that he who touches Jerusalem touches the apple of God's eye. Now, there are three ways in which God will turn this invasion back. First of all, through a great earthquake. In Ezekiel 38, verses 18 to 20, we read, And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake, the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the, the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth, notice, shall shake at my presence, the Lord's presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. The great shaking, of course, we read about a, a great shaking, don't we? In the book of Hebrews, whenever the Lord will not only shake the heavens, but also the earth. Secondly, he will turn this invasion back through friendly fire. Now, friendly fire is whenever soldiers in an army fire upon their own comrades, those who are in the same army. That's what's known as friendly fire. And during the last Gulf War, there was a British tornado which was returning from an attack on Baghdad. And it was shot down by a US Patriot missile with the loss of of its crew, or in other words, friendly fire. In Ezekiel 38, verse 21, here's what we read. God says, I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Notice, every man's sword will be against his brother. Every man's sword will be against his brother. And so one of the ways in which God will turn this invasion back, he will turn Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, Magog back, is that every man's sword will be against his brother. Thirdly, then, we also see that God will use a great thunderstorm. In Ezekiel 38, verse 22, we read, God says, And I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. So the Lord will even use hailstones to turn this invasion back. And a number of years ago, in 2003, on the 25th of June, the Independent Record actually reported that hailstones the size of volleyballs fell in Nebraska. And I think the hailstones that will fall at the Lord's return, the great hailstones will be even bigger than those in 2003 in Nebraska. Now we see two reasons why God will turn this invasion back. First of all, so that many nations will know that God is the Lord. That God is the Lord. Ezekiel 38 verse 23. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known, notice, in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. What a fantastic day that will be. Whenever the nations will realise that the Lord, he is God. That God is the Lord. And secondly, so that the house of Israel will know that the Lord is their God. God has not forgotten his people, Israel. In Ezekiel 39, verse 22, So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. Hallelujah. In Zechariah 14, verses 4 and 5, here's what we read. And on that day, his feet, whose feet? The feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azel. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come 
and all the saints with you. Again, remember when this was prophesied in the 6th century BC, Russia was not the powerful nation that she is today. She was roamed by the nomadic tribes around the north of the Black and the Caspian Seas, and they were known as the wildest barbarians. But yet look at the way prophecy ha has come about and Russia, of course, is, is a powerful nation today, as, many, as well as many of the other nations that are mentioned in this prophecy. You see, when you look at the world today, you see prophecies coming alive, don't you? As I said earlier, the Lord says about nation against nation and against pestilences. We also see that even Israel's back in our land today. It's like a... A great chessboard, isn't it? It's like the chessboard of the world and all the pieces seem to be getting moved into place. Now you might say, well, Mark, the Lord mightn't come back for 100 years, 500 years. That, that, that is very possible. He, he might not. But again, the early church believed in the imminent return of Christ. In other words, they were expecting the return of Christ and that's the way we should be living our lives. That's why Jesus says, watch. Watch and pray, says because you don't know they are. And so yes, the Lord might not come back for 100 years, for 500 years, but he also could be back before this uh, message is finished. And so that's why we need to be ready. We need to watch. In Matthew 24, verse 30, Jesus says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. In Luke 21 verse 28 we read, Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your, your heads because your redemption draws near. You see, Christ hasn't told us the day or the hour when he will return. That's why we need to be ready. That's why we need to be ready. Now look at me. Are you ready? Are you ready for the Lord's return? Are you ready for the Lord's return? You might say, well, Mark, it might not happen in, in our lifetime. It might not, but it could. But we're all going to die. We're all going to die eventually if the Lord tarries. And we're going to meet the Master. Jesus says, therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour. You do not expect, Matthew 24, verse 44. I wonder, are you ready? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour? Because... That's the most important thing that matters because nations come and nations go but we need to make sure that our foundation is on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know Christ is your saviour? If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ is your saviour, especially in these perilous days that we're living in, but no matter where it's peaceful or no matter where it's war time, we need to know Jesus as our saviour because our eternal destiny is at stake. If you don't know Christ, I trust that you'll turn from your sin and ask the Lord Jesus Christ into your life to be your Lord and Saviour. Uh, to be your Lord and Saviour. He loves you. He's died for you on the cross. He's got a plan for you. His plans are to prosper you, not to harm you. What's holding you back? Amen.